thanks, Ivona. It's a great pleasure to be here um, uh, and learn about the eFutures network. Fantastic. Um, so you're right. I will uh, speak uh, focused on uh, silicon carbide and possibly a few words on gallium nitride for, for these high voltage, high power applications. And you see my, my very prestigious title here, zero carbon economy. Uh, at least this is one little piece of uh, improvement that we can add to, to, to getting there with no carbon emission. So uh, the pictures you see there is just one of our fantastic transistors that we produced in the lab on the right hand side of the, of the, of the uh, picture there. Uh, so uh, much of the work we, we are doing is based in this building. We are very pleased with that one. So please next, next one and maybe you can, um, yeah, uh, I, I put in a short agenda for this short talk. We have a challenge, I will speak about that. We have solutions and I will uh, propose a couple of needs that we need to have. So please go ahead with the next one and you can click further um, to fill up the, the whole screen. <clears throat> and one more there. Um, so this is a common challenge that we all are aware of. The global warming, the emissions, and what to do about that. Uh, conservation, of course, uh, of the uh, sources of energy. Uh, we need to improve all systems for efficiency, uh, which leads to power devices. The uh, renewable energy is uh, solar and, and uh, wind, of course. And uh, we need to be very careful about um, the energy we get from those. We, we shouldn't waste them in, in conversion system and so on, but we should uh, improve that uh, so much as we can. And by, uh, this is a statement by Professor Baliga that um, um, at least 50% of all the energy, uh, electric energy is passing our power devices. So I think it's a good focus to optimize them. Next, please. This is what uh, what we do in the world. Uh, I just took some uh, downloads from from uh, Statistica, and um, <clears throat> we are we are sort of consuming like twenty five thousand terawatt hours um, globally. That's a pretty neat <laughs> amount of energy electricity. And if you go to the next one, this is the way that we generate uh, electrical energy. It's, it's a sad sight. Uh, you see the big portions are coal, gas, and oil. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's almost 63% of the total electricity production that goes with those uh, nasty production uh, plants. So if we can reduce uh, or if we can make everything more efficient, we will definitely lower uh, the uh, emission rate there. So if we go to the next one, this is where we, pro, uh, where we consume this. Uh, China, US, India, Russia, Japan are the biggest ones. Uh, Europe is, uh, is there, uh, but um, in China and US and India, most of the production comes from these fossil-based um, energy plants. So uh, there is a big need for, for improvement here. So next one, please. I just put down some, some of this. These numbers are not exactly, but it was just the numbers I found when I tried to look. So 63% generated by fossil-based fuel, uh, bad. We need to change that energy mix. Uh, we are not doing that by semiconductors, but uh, the the, the way we take care of, of the energy generation is basically what we can improve by our semiconductors. So we need to be careful about how we produce, distribute, and consume the energy, of course. I see a great fortune here with, with the power electronics based on the wide band gap semiconductors. They are inherently so much more uh, efficient than, than the silicon technology. Silicon technology is not bad, but we can do even better. And it was uh, very interesting to see the previous talks also. So what we say, what we need is basically, we need everything that we can find to make these kind of things fly 
and to get them economically viable because economic e economy rules whatever physics we present if it's not uh, cheap enough it will never happen unfortunately so here is just uh, an example if you can uh, improve the efficiency by one percent we can basically save like five six hundred uh, typical sized uh, coal-based power plants that's the size of it just one percent and we can do so much better with with these devices so that was a short introduction uh, so next please the, the wide band gap device landscape here's a, a, a picture from joel uh, the the joel company that uh, makes uh, um, predictions on on what what happens we can see that um, there's a lot of, of different applications here. And um, uh, we have silicon carbide, which is a fairly mature technology, still in need of uh, great improvements, wafer sizes, and so on. Uh, we have gallium nitride uh, coming along very nicely, but, but uh, it has uh, different um, aspects there. And uh, sometimes we, we say that, uh, should we go for silicon carbide or gallium nitride? We have to go with both, and we have to co coexist this with, with silicon. Silicon is still there. Still, silicon will still always be there. But uh, so we, we should not see it as a competition. We should see it as a possibility to, to include uh, things where, where they work at the best. So my simple view is silicon carbide uh, technology for the higher voltages gallium nitride for uh, voltages up to one ki kilovolt um, and silicon can be also a part of all that uh, so that's that's what we have today and if we go to the next one here we can also look at the different um, um, operating frequencies uh, we heard uh, about some high frequency applications uh, in the previous talks so gallium nitride can, of course, take care of, of higher frequencies. And uh, uh, silicon carbide is uh, very good on the even higher um, voltages. So you see all the inset, picture insets there with, with, the, uh, with the grid, the rail, uh, electric vehicles, uh, power supplies, and so on. We need everything here. And uh, um, what I would like to say is also that we need to understand it takes so much time. It takes so much time from that we think as researchers that, oh, now we have a very good uh, thing. We started a startup company. Uh, next year, we will see these products in, 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 in cars or whatever. It takes 10 years. Absolutely. Believe me. Uh, so next, next uh, slide, please. So I'm, I'm personally more uh, um, researching silicon carbide than, than the other materials. Uh, so I also have a sort of um, um, fasc fascination for bipolar power. Uh, and that has been um, sort of, although we are an ultra high technology market here, um, we are quite conservative when it comes to, to designing with different uh, type of devices. So today, everything is being designed by MOSFETs. And uh, I think, believe Anthony will also talk about MOSFETs. Of course, they are fantastic uh, devices. But the bipolars, if we have the materials uh, quality under control, we can get so much lower on resistance by that, by that. So for the really high voltages, I foresee that bipolar components will be the dominating type of devices when you get um, high injection uh, criteria, the carrier lifetime is high and you can do that. So if we go to the next one, here's an apparent uh, uh, solution where a wide band gap solution uh, can go from, uh, if you look at the lower part of the picture, you have 12 parts plus a heat sink, and that can go into one very nice uh, package to, um, multiple device uh, carrier. So that's the gain you can get. This is a company called Rome uh, that has um, set up this, uh, this uh, scenario with their um, uh, commercial devices. So if you go to the next one, uh, what is driving 
all this. Um, I'm a bit fascinated by, by these uh, fantastic cars. Here's a Koenig uh, car. It's a Swedish brand name, so you can understand why I chose this one. But there's a lot of money into that. And uh, you have a lot of money to invest and, and um, really set together everything in the drivetrain. And what I'm showing here is the inverter, which has a peak um, power capacity of 750 kilowatts. The volume is 10 liters. The weight is 15 kilograms. It's a six, six phase um, uh, structure and it's a, it, it is a silicon carbide uh, fitted uh, unit. You need to have driving forces uh, to, to explore these kind of things. So it can be done and uh, it's fantastic basically. Look at that uh, power density. So if we take the next one, I, I, I'm not so biased, so I cannot show only silicon carbide. I, I want to show you this one also. Here's another example when, when you set a challenge. Google Little Box Challenge uh, was set up by Google, of course. They wanted to have a two kilovolt inverter and they want to minimize the volume of that uh, inverter. And a company called CE plus T won that competition and they used the gallium nitride technology devices um, and they also fiddle a bit with, with the passives on board but look at what they achieved the uh, the challenge was to reduce the 200 cubic inch to 40 cubic inch but they managed to squeeze it into 13.8 inch uh, i tried to calculate in liters because i mean in in, in the si system I think it's uh, roughly 2.2 liters with, with a two kilowatt um, powered power in, in that small volume. So you can do it um, if you are challenged to do it. Um, with that uh, advancement, you can get uh, things to be implemented in, for example, cars, of course, but also in other consumer electronics. So we can go to the next one. So it took uh, many years before um, wide band gap materials or devices uh, came into the uh, commercial cars. Here is a fantastic um, um, setup by Tesla uh, and they are always uh, driving the, the technology. They, they put in an inverter module in their model three and they use uh, ST microelectronics um, uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs. Uh, it's set up by 48 uh, transistors in a very neat package. If you take the next, uh, there you have it. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing here is why I show it. It, it took some years before they did it. Um, we developed a company back in um, 2005 sold it in 2011 i thought it would go directly into the car uh, car industry no it didn't uh, it's just about money it was too expensive at the time but now tesla has sh sh paved the way the way and and uh, what they are doing here is that only model 3 is consuming basically the whole production capacity of the st microelectronics uh, uh, facility so my, my message here is that we need uh, dramatically increasing the, uh, uh, the device manufacturing capacity in the world. If this model alone uh, basically consumes what they have at, at, the, at the moment, maybe a little bit exaggerated, but um, I mean, these are company secrets, so, so we don't exactly know, but just that, uh, proves to me that we need to have capacity all over the world for these fantastic um, solutions. So if we take the next one, uh, this is not a brand new uh, picture and uh, example. It's in Japan. I think they are one of the world leaders on silicon carbide wide, wide band gap uh, technology. They uh, had this uh, test bed in the Ginza subway and they, they could show that um, Basically, they could um, uh, make uh, the, the uh, electric unit 40% smaller and lighter and um, still having very good power. Uh, the total 
the power savings was up to 40 percent. So uh, I have also seen some similar tests in Sweden in our subway in Stockholm, and they could also show similar numbers. So just imagine how much energy we can we can uh, um, save by introducing these kind of devices. So the next one, please. Just to uh, uh, advertise a little bit of what we have done in, in my lab at KTH, we did this uh, 15 kilowatt class bipolar junction transistor with a very thick um, uh, drift layer you see in, in, uh, in the middle of the device cross section. Uh, we had a very elaborate uh, junction termination extension just to accommodate the high voltage along the surface. So there's a, some tricks in that, but uh, also it's very dependent on the materials quality that this uh, very thick drift layer doesn't have too much uh, uh, defects inside. Um, basal plane dislocation has been uh, almost a showstopper in the beginning of the silicon carbide era, but it has been uh, minimized now, so there's basically no problem. So I foresee these kind of devices coming up for, for the really high voltage uh, applications like for, for the grid installations and, and so on. It can be done. It's not a huge market yet. Uh, and people are just working mostly on the um, 1200 and 1700 volt um, uh, class devices for, for those normal high voltage applications. But I, I can foresee that this is coming. So please, next one, summary. Yeah, we, we have seen so many examples. So many companies are today producing all these kind of uh, Schottkis, uh, JFETs, MOSFETs, and uh, bipolars are coming, but uh, it's not uh, basically a big market yet. The uh, war is about the long-term stability is passed, and I, I think uh, these devices uh, on the market are as reliable, more reliable than the silicon ones, uh, almost. So we have that. Uh, we need a massive rollout of production, produ production capacity, I, I would say. And um, uh, we still have to be uh, concerned with the cost, of course. But uh, it's the chicken and egg uh, <laughs> dilemma here. Um, I mean, with the mass production and, and uh, tuning of the, the production technology, the price comes down. Uh, no, no, no question about that. But is it quick enough? Um, so I would say uh, we haven't seen so much yet, but I, I foresee a full roll, rollout, and I think the the economy is there. And one thing that has, I think, we should take care of here is that the shortage of semiconductor devices in the world. The good thing about that is that our politicians have now understand and they are aware that there is something peculiar co called uh, uh, semiconductors and devices. So let's let's go for that and, and uh, lobby for, for um, also governmental in, in, in intervening with, with the uh, different uh, programs. I think we have a window of opportunity here. Thanks very much for your attention.